an explanation. Um, would any of the pastors like to take forth? The question uh, was from Exodus 4.11. Uh, there's been uh, an explanation asked for the question by Avni, the verse by Avni, I'm sorry. Nancy, you want to go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, Pastor, I'll, I'll just share a few thoughts. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, okay, um, thank you, Avni, for this question. Uh, so in this question, uh, or the scripture that you have shared, uh, it seems as if it is God who um, intentionally makes people dumb or deaf uh, or blind, uh, right? So uh, that, that's how it comes to. But again, when we interpret scripture, we've learned that we have to interpret in light of other scripture. So uh, when we consider uh, the life of Jesus and when we consider passages in the New Testament, you know, one, one passage that uh, I want to uh, turn to is Hebrews 1 and verse 3. Over there, uh, I'll read it out uh, for us. It says, who being the brightness of his glory and the experts image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had himself uh, he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So here uh, we are told that the Lord Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. And he's also the express image of his person. Express image of his person is, is like saying, you know, exactly, uh, exactly. It's like, you know, in the stamp, you have the same seal, right? Like when you stamp it, um, the same image comes on, on your envelopes, papers. So Jesus is the same, um, you know, he's in the image of the Father. And we know from the life of Jesus, you know, there are several passages that we see that you know, he healed uh, those who were sick, people who were uh, mute, blind, uh, people who were dumb very clearly we know that that's what jesus did and so in what jesus did we understand who god is and god is also our healer and we we also know like you know if you go back to um uh, exodus where there we see that you know he he proclaimed that he's the god who heals us so you know in in that manner when we consider the person of god we are very clear that god is a healer even though this passage um seems like you know god is somebody who has inflicted sickness uh, on people uh, that is not so so uh, yes those were some thoughts i wanted to share pastor uh, you could please uh, take over thank you yeah that's uh, what nancy said is right so um in our attempt to understand scripture um you know we look at jesus christ because he is the word embodied he is like nancy said hebrews 1 he is a father fully revealed to us so this is who god is so god is the one who gives sight to the blind god is the one who makes the dumb to speak he makes the deaf to hear he makes the maimed whole this is what jesus did so if that is true then the opposite cannot also be true that means god cannot also be the one making the blind and the deaf and the song because then he would be self-contradictory uh, which we call schizophrenic, right? He's opposite, two polar opposites in the same being, cannot be that way, right? So God's nature is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, the God who makes all things well. So then how do we understand these Old Testament scriptures? So the underlying premises, all scripture must be interpreted in the light of the rest of scripture. And the centrality of in scriptural interpretation is the person of Christ. It has to be interpreted in the person of Jesus Christ himself. So when we want to go to these old, so there are many Old Testament passages that seemingly attribute to God acts of destruction, acts of evil. For example, this one. Or there, there are other passages in the Old Testament where, and some, and some in the New Testament as well, where uh, you know it says evil spirits from God came and troubled so and so. But we know there are no evil spirits in heaven and God is good. God is not the one who's sending evil, right? So uh, uh, so we need to understand, how do we understand it? Well, what we then therefore say is this, that when the scripture is saying things like uh, evil spirits from God came or God made the, you know, like Exodus 4.11, it's, you know, uh, the blind, the dumb, then, God is, so Exodus 4.11, how do we understand it? 
one, God is creator of every human person. So regardless of what the physical condition of that person is, if he's blind, dumb, deaf, God is his creator. But we cannot attribute the problem, the specific problem, as an act of God. Why? Because we see also in Romans chapter 8, you know, uh, we read about this in uh, verses uh, uh, 19 to 24, Romans 8, 19 to 24, where Paul explains to us that all of creation is in subjection to corruption, which is a deviation from God's original design. So God originally is creator. He set the process of cro procreation in place. So in that sense, he is the creator of all human beings. But the process of procreation itself has been corrupted, according to Romans 8, 19 to 24, which means it has deviated from its original design because of the fall. And consequently, because of that process of decay, the deviation from God's original design, we have human beings who are born with these deformities. But is God responsible for the deformity? No. Is God creator of that person? Yes, in the sense because God is the one who set the whole process of procreation in place. He is the creator of every human person. But God is not directly responsible for the deformities that people are born with or that they may have later on in life because that has come in, as Romans 8 says, because of the bondage of corruption that all of creation is subject to. So that's how we interpret these passages. The thing that we must keep in mind is that uh, these uh, these problems, uh, that there are times when um, God does, uh, you know, in judgment, God does uh, use, uh, uh, you know, na natural elements that we do see, but that's only the case of judgment. What I would refer to you, uh, what I would refer you to, Avani, is uh, chapter two in our book on healing and deliverance, uh, where we kind of address all of these questions. So if you just quick, if you just take time to just review that chapter two on our book on healing and deliverance, uh, we list Exodus 4.11, as well as many other scriptures that seemingly attribute to God, um, you know, uh, these kinds of things. So chapter two in our book on healing and deliverance addresses all of these. Avni, I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, I think it did. Yes, um, we have another question by uh, Kiran. Uh, she's she's asked, can you explain about the old covenant, the new covenant, and the blood covenant also? Um, would the blood covenant happen in today's time? Uh, I open the question out again. Uh, to the faculty. Pastor, would you kindly be able to take the question? Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, so Old Covenant, New Covenant. All right, so both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant are blood covenants. Um, so you remember the course we did uh, on, uh, I think it's our second year course on uh, uh, the cross, uh, the covenants, the cross, the blood, right? We covered everything on the old covenant and the new covenant. Uh, both these covenants are blood covenants. Um, and uh, the old covenant was established through Moses, Exodus 24. And the new covenant, of course, is, is, was established through Jesus Christ, Matthew 26. So if you review those course notes, you'll get everything about the old covenant, the new covenant. And then uh, can blood covenant happen today? Now, a blood covenant, uh, you know, covenant is any solemn promise that two parties make a promise. So marriage is a covenant. Uh, can blood covenant, if two people want to do a blood covenant, uh, they can, you know, uh, uh, there's not nobody's, you know, but uh, but typically how um, 
uh, communities in the old times established blood covenant was you know they would cut a they make an incision and then exchange blood so if two people want to do that it's up to them so that's a blood covenant but there's no need for a new blood covenant between us and god there's only one new covenant established through the blood of jesus christ is that okay uh, kiran i hope that answered your question for further review i think you can go back to the uh, year two um, course that you have done on covenants that will help you greater for, for more reading all right thank you um we have another question by divya um, um she brings up luke 22 31 to 32 and uh, i'll read that for us it says simon simon satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat but i have prayed for you simon that your faith may not fail and when you have turned back strengthen your brothers the question is what does this passage imply about Satan's schemes and asking permission to God to tempt his children. What is this? Yes, yes, Pastor, yeah. please. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in because this is kind of a controversial passage. So I thought I'd just step in. Yeah, so a uh, couple of thoughts on this, these two verses. Um, first of all, uh, in verse 31, that word has asked, all right? In the Greek, um, that word could mean demand, or it could also mean desired. And I think the King James version, if I'm not mistaken, translates. Let me it translate it. Translates it as Satan has desired you. you know, uh, look, uh, look, um, twenty-two. I'm just looking this up here. I think it's the King James that says. Um, uh, Satan has, yeah, Luke 22, 31, in the King James, uh, that word is translated desired. So other translations, especially modern ones, they put it as demanded or asked for, you know, so just to keep that thought in mind that in verse 31, that word has asked, okay, the Greek word has asked for you, could be translated has demanded for you or has desired for you. Now, the problem is that a whole aspect of theology has been built just on the meaning of that one word, uh, you know, which is, I think, the basis of this courts of heaven teaching, which, you know, I, I don't agree with. But it, one of the key verses here is verse 31, you know, so Satan has went in, so the implication is Satan went to God and got permission. And God said, okay. And so then he went and tempted Satan. I mean, Satan went and tempted Simon. That's the implication of it. Satan has asked. Whom did he ask? Obviously, he has to ask God, so the higher authority. So the implication of that understanding is Satan went and asked God for permission to attack Simon Peter. But remember, that word could also be simply translated desired. So Satan simply desired to attack you. So now that's one thing. The second thing is, remember, this is things happening before the cross. Because this passage, along with what happened in Job chapter 1, is used as the basis for the courts of heaven teaching. You know, Satan went and asked God, haven't you seen Job? He's such a perfect man. Then, you know, God gives, you know, but you've he says you've, you've got a hedge of protection. God gives Satan permission to go and attack Job. So the same idea is used from Exodus 20 to 31 if you interpret that word, verse, the Greek word as has asked for, right? But remember that Greek word could also be interpreted simply as he has desired you for, like the King James puts it. So, so therefore, Satan goes, asks, and then he comes and attacks. But remember, this was also before the cross. So what did the cross do? The cross tells us very clearly that Satan was judged and sentenced. This is John chapter 16, I think verse 8, where uh, Jesus says, you know, uh, now is the ruler of this world um, judged, 
right? John 16, 8. Uh, let's see. Was that okay? And uh, uh, so John 16, 8 and 11, sorry, 8 and 11. John 16, 8 and 11. So on the cross, what happened? Satan was judged. That means you can imagine that it's, it's a legal word saying the courts were held and the verdict was announced. This man is, this Satan is sentenced, meaning case is over. So if that is, and that is true. So that means there's no more, Satan has no more access to go back to God to ask for you and me, because look, it's already done, you're sentenced. Don't come back and ask for anything more because the cases are closed, right? The work is done. Um, so uh, we are living after the cross. So let's say that prior to the cross, maybe based on these two scriptures, Job chapter 1 and Luke 22 31. Maybe Satan had to go and ask permission before he could attack a righteous person, if that was the process. That process definitely changed after the cross because after the cross, sentence was done. Jesus sentenced Satan. The court was dismissed because verdict announced. So we are no longer subject to this kind of process of Satan going and attack and getting permission from God in order to attack us. So that's one thing you need to keep in mind. Secondly, you know, like I, I've said before, uh, Satan is a finite being. So if he's going to get permission to attack, say, person A, and uh, then he, you know, there are, let's say, about 4 billion believers on, or 3 billion believers on the earth, before he can get to, you know, 3 billion, it's probably going to take many years because he, he has to go and keep getting permission. And if you if you if you ex extend this whole idea of what's coming out from this, uh, he's a finite being. He's not an infinite being. He's not an omniscient being. So for him to get permission to attack and tempt every believer would simply mean some believers will never be tempted or attacked for a long, long, long time. But is that the case? No. Every believer faces temptation. Every believer faces satanic attacks every day. Right? We're all tempted. Temptations come every day. So. Again, just from an experiential understanding, that process of Satan having to go to God to get permission to attack a believer is not practical, right? So, uh, my, on my, my look at Luke 22, 31, 32, simply this, Jesus had revelation that Satan was planning this attack on the enemy. He desired, like as King James puts it, he desired, he desired, his intent was, I'm going to go after Peter. And, but Jesus had intercepted that plan through his prayer and intercession. So that's how I would look at Luke 21, 22, 31, and 32. Is that okay? Yes, Pastor. I just have a follow up to that. Uh, so now say it has become easier for Satan. He doesn't have to go ask permission. Uh, but remember, now Satan is a defeated enemy. He's actually a disarmed enemy. So when he's coming against the believer, he's actually coming with zero weapons. He's stripped of everything. Mm -hmm. So right now, Satan can only play mind games. Satan can only do guerrilla tactics. He no longer has his weapons against. So uh, what are his tactics? Intimidation, evil thoughts. Uh, basically, thoughts and deceptions and lies are his main tactic. And in front of the believer, he's powerless because he's been disarmed. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Hebrews 2, 14. Jesus has destroyed him by the power of death. So really, after the cross... Satan is sig so much more less powerful than before. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, just one more reference, uh, Pastor. I just want to ask uh, 1 Corinthians 10 13, where it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Mm. So here, uh, when it says God will not allow you to be tempted, um, 
why is that language is used? Is it uh, like God is allowing the temptation? So in what sense, you know, so the basic question is, in what sense does God allow our temptation? The answer is very simple, by letting you live on earth. Right? The moment you're born on earth, from that moment on, see, God has allowed us to be on earth. And right now, the Bible tells us, First John 5, 19, the whole earth is in the lap of the wicked one. So very fact, God allowed you, you and me to be born on the earth. He's allowed us to be born in a very dark environment. So in that sense, God is allowing us to be tempted, right? But the point is, he's not going to let you go through it alone. He's already aided us by giving us his word and his spirit. Then... Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 1, the entire book of Hebrews unveils to us a great high priest to whom we can go to receive help, to receive aid. So in what sense is God allowing us to be tempted, letting us live on the earth? We are all being tempted. We are in this realm of darkness. But he's not going to just sit back and do nothing. He's given us everything we need to overcome temptation. And so we engage with God to find a way of escape, right? So our prayer is, we must pray. Do not lead us into temptation. So is that, does that mean God is leading you to the devil? That's not the idea. The idea is, don't let me go down a path where I'm going to face this attack or temptation. So do not lead me into temptation. Do not allow me to go down this path but deliver me from evil or keep me from evil, right? So if God was the one who was going to take me to the devil, no. You know, or even when Luke 4 or Matthew 4, when it says Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, it doesn't mean that he was saying, go, 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 you know, no. He's going, he led him to this 40 days of seeking God, but in that seeking God, there was temptation going to happen. Temptation was going to happen. Now, was Jesus tempted at other times? Of course, because the Bible says he was in all points tempted like us we are, right? So Jesus facing temptation is not just God doing it. The fact is throughout his life on earth, from his, you know, he was tempted in all points like as we are, right? So this whole, we, we can't base this whole theology saying, you know, God is the one taking me into tempt. No. God, the James 1 says, God does not tempt us with evil, neither is he tempted by anyone. Right? James 1, I think it's verse 13, 14. So God does not tempt us, and he, does, he cannot be tempted by evil. Okay, Pastor. Thank you. It's much clearer. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Divya, for that question. Um, would anybody else like to bring up any question? You could unmute and bring forth your questions or even put it on the chat. Anything that you've learned through the last week, through the years before, or something that you're doing in your personal study. open for questions. Maybe we had a couple of scriptures that we've looked into today. 
anything else? Yes, uh, Rupa, um, I can mute and you could let, uh, bring us your question. Oh, I think she she logged off from the meeting. Uh, hi, Rupa, back good to you. Yes, 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 go ahead. Okay, good morning, everyone. I have a small doubt, ma'am. Uh, I'm counseling one uh, family for the past few days. They are going on a very painful journey. That brother is uh, suffering with uh, fourth stage lung cancer. But God is, uh, help, has helped him to come accept Christ and come into his fold. But he has few fear, fears saying that Somebody has done something to me, some witchcraft or something like that. That is the reason I am like this. So many fears. But when I pray, I don't feel anything like that. I'm trying to just comfort him and strengthen him. He's saying, once you come into the fold and once you accept Christ, you are under the blood. And unless you have something specific you have done against God, you just repent and Ask God forgiveness and God will deliver you from that. Is it, is it enough for me to say that or is it anything else I have to do for him to be delivered from that fear, from those fears? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rupa. So the question Rupa posed was with uh, someone who she's helping who's diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. Um, has fears that what he's going through is because of something he's done. Uh, so Rupa would like to know, is there anything more that she needs to do uh, apart from what she's done of uh, letting the person know that uh, he's been redeemed by the curse um, and by, by the Lord and by, by his blood? Um, is there anything else that uh, she needs to do? I'm opening this up uh, to the pastors. Pastor Nancy or Pastor Roshan? Yes, uh, thank you, Ruchi. Thank you, Sister Rupa, for that question. And uh, so uh, happy to hear that you're counseling this person uh, and that uh, he's accepted Christ as well. Uh, so I'd just like to uh, add some thoughts. What you have uh, told him is correct. Um, and uh, um, uh, But, you know, just to, to kind of reaffirm uh, what you've shared with him in a couple of scriptures with him uh, see numbers 23 23 this passage you know uh, even in the old testament it says there's no uh, uh, divination or take up but you know basically there's no witchcraft against the people of god so you know that time you know god had promised to his people that he's going to protect them from uh, such evil works now in addition to that in the new testament uh, when we talk about the authority of the believer um luke 10 90 you know, that's another passage where uh, jesus said that you know i give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions um and you know, over all power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall hurt you so once again you know, that that reiterates that we we have the authority and um, since he has this fear that somebody has done something to him you can say that we are victorious now that we are in christ jesus we are victorious over the evil one uh, one more uh, scripture that you could share would be like 1 john 5 18 where you know we we are told that when we are walking with the lord that the evil one cannot touch us and uh, in addition to this um as pastor was uh, sharing you know satan is a defeated foe uh, he is disarmed uh, he is um, you know um, expelled we we know that he's already been defeated so uh, you could also just share that with him so that he understands that as a believer uh, we are victorious and satan is defeated we don't have to be afraid uh, you know um, of the enemy so just wanted to share these thoughts uh, sister rupa and i hope it helps 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, I just wanted to share another verse at, uh, uh, of, of 1 John 5, 4, that whoever is born of God overcomes the world. Um, so that again, I, I'm sure there's a lot more of scripture that uh, that you can encourage uh, him with. Uh, I'm opening it out to either Pastor or um, Pastor Roshan, if you all would like to add anything more or bring up any more verses to help Rupa to share with this person. Uh, I'm good. Good, Jean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Jean. I'm good too. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so we'll go ahead uh, with any other question. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes, Rupa. Thank you. Thank you for the question. We have another close to 10 to 12 minutes. Um, anybody would like to pose any further questions? Okay, so Vivia has brought about a question. Um, I think it's a follow-up of what Rupa has also asked. Uh, so if anyone does witchcraft, will it not affect the believers, especially if the believer is unaware? Yes, I'm opening the question out. Would any of the faculty take up the question, please? Pastor, um, please go ahead, Pastor. No, okay. Um, uh, yes, Divya. Um, so basically, uh, so the answer to your question is yes, right? That uh, a believer uh, does not need to be afraid. And um, witchcraft, like Proverbs 26 and verse 2 says, a curse without a cause will not a light or will not come upon a person so that means uh you know somebody can try and curse a believer but um as long as there's no cause that means the believer has not left the door open or you know um, um you know as long as we are walking uh, the way we should walk uh, this curse will not have any effect but there are things that will open the door to these things one is of course fear if a believer is living in fear, then fear is going to open the door. It gives Satan an opportunity. And there could be other things like uh, basically any kind of sin opens the door. Continuous uh, unconfessed sin will open the door, meaning it gives the door Satan an opportunity to you know, come in. That's why Ephesians 4, uh, I think it's verse 27, it, uh, Paul writes, you know, uh, don't give no place to the devil. That means don't give him any foothold. So it's a believer's responsibility to keep all doors closed. And if I'm living the way I'm supposed to be living as a believer, none of these things will affect me and Satan will not have any access, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. Thank you, Pastor. Um, John has a question. Um, would Satan have a right to accuse us in case if there are sins forgiven? He's br brought an example. I committed a sin and asked forgiveness to God, and I know that I'm forgiven. You know, during pray praying for deliverance from manifesting of demons, can Satan accuse regarding the forgiven sins? I'm opening this out again, Pastor. Uh, can he do it or will he do it? The answer is yes. That's his job. That's what condemnation is. Condemnation means to accuse, to make us feel bad about even things that we are forgiven. So will he do it? Yeah, that's what he always does. Even though we are forgiven, he accuses us. He make, condemns us, right? He makes us feel bad, even though God has already 
forgiven us. So that's where the bit. So will he do it? Will he do it? I mean, that's in the mind. He will put those accusing, condemning thoughts, even though, you know, we have been already forgiven. But that's why he's a liar, right? He's a father of lies. He's actually lying to the believer. And how does a believer confront lies with the truth? The truth is, the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all sin. So that's why we have to stand in the truth. And with the truth, the word of God, reject the lies of the enemy. The lies of the enemy come in to us in the area of the mind, accusing us, condemning us. So in fact, anytime you're going to do anything, you're going to stand up to worship, you're going to stand up to pray, you're going to stand up to do something. The enemy is very faithful to do his job, which is to remind us of our past, our sins, our failures, in order to accuse and condemn us. Yeah, okay? thank, you. thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Joel. Do we have any more questions? Yeah. Maybe the last five to seven minutes. Yes, Pastor Jim. Uh, yes, I was, mm, yeah. I, I've been asking myself about how, like, a, a revelation can come to you when you you're you're awake. So it's like you're just there. You see the thought, maybe God telling you to do something. Um, or you like someone told me that. He, uh, God showed me a, a, a verse to read, then I went and, re and read. Then I asked myself, now, uh, maybe you hear a voice coming to you, telling you that you read such and such a verse. Oh, I was wondering how it comes when you, you, you're awake. You, you see like, an, okay, something of that nature. You see like a, a thought coming. You see like, do this. Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, Pastor Ashish can uh, maybe give me some more explanation. Thank you. Uh, yes, Pastor. Uh, so I think, uh, yes, yes, Pastor, go ahead. Herbert, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Herbert, remember, uh, we have... Um, uh, just like in the natural, I mean, a good way to understand this is just like in the natural, right? We have eyes, uh, we can see, we can hear, and we can feel. In the same way, in our spirit, our human spirit inside, right? We can see, we can hear, we can feel. So where does the Holy Spirit speak to us? Uh, Romans 8, 14, right? The spirit bears witness or he speaks the spirit bears witness with our spirit so the holy spirit speaks to us in our spirit so that means he communicates to us in our spirit so um how does he how would he do it through our fa spirit faculties three main things what we see what we hear what we feel. So when he gives us revelation, it comes to us in our spirit, sometimes through what we see, that means what your spirit sees, right? Now, uh, yeah, thanks, Romans 8, 16, yeah, thanks. So, um, so you would see, sometimes you can just, maybe, you know, just reminds you of the scripture and verse, you know, like uh, this verse, a reference or the words of that verse will come up, right? Or sometimes you may hear, but hear means it doesn't, uh, hearing in the spirit is not always with sound, right? It can just be words coming up or just the knowledge coming up. That means you're hearing. And right? when the knowledge of, you know, sometimes you're walking along and suddenly a verse just comes up, the, the, the text of a verse or part of a verse comes up, you're hearing. Uh, sometimes you can be impressed, you feel the presence of God, and then you are reminded of a scripture. So that's one way of revelation. He can speak to you. But also revelation comes as you read the Bible. 
you know, so example, you open the Bible, you're reading, and suddenly, you know, your eyes are open. Like, hey, you've been reading a passage, but you're seeing something you haven't seen before, and that's revelation. And that happens all the time, I think, for all of us. When we open the Bible scriptures, we read, and you begin to see things. You know, like uh, almost every day, hey, I, I never saw that before. Oh, so that's revelation. The Holy Spirit is teaching you as you're reading the scriptures. So one is a spiritual side, which is the Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. One is a practical side. As you're reading scripture, he's opening your eyes, enlightening your eyes to see things you haven't seen. Is that okay, Hubbard? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It has ripped me. Thank you. Thank you, Hubbard. Uh, Charles, uh, is would this be a follow-up question? Uh, if it is a fresh question, I'm requesting that you hold it on for next week. Is it a follow-up question, Charles? Yeah, it's it's a testimony. It's a testimony towards Habati on, right. on how the, the God speaks. Uh, I remember when I was in prison in 2007, and God spoke to me when I was asleep. And in the morning at around 9.30, I was seated. He spoke to me when I was not asleep. And uh, nobody could hear the voice because the spirit part that he put in us connects with the spirit of his and he, we, you are able to hear. He speaks to our spirit. He even spoke to me again when I was not asleep he spoke to me so he, the, the spirit part that is in us is able to hear the spirit of god so as uh, pastor ashish was talking about the spiritual part it does it very very well yes and then when he talked of the of the of the reading of the word of god he also speaks to us he can even use another person to speak to us so uh, God is supernatural. He can use any format of speaking. What, require, what is required of us is to be sensitive, that our spiritual antennae are sensitive, that we are able to hear him. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, and on that note, I think we can we end uh, knowing that we keep our, uh, our eyes, our ears, our senses open to what the spirit has to reveal to us through this day and through class thank you so much everybody for joining in may i kindly request one of the students to close with a word of prayer please can i pray yes surely charles please go ahead father god we thank you so much for your love this is love this is love explained in a format that human beings cannot understand. That, again, fellow human beings are sharpening us so that we are able to live a life that pleases you, that we are able to get an explanation, that we are equipped to be able to withstand the devil, that we will be able to, to stand the devil and be able to live a life that pleases you. Thank you so much for the revelations that you are continuing to give us and that you are yet to give us, that we will be able to meet you when we are perfect, when we are mature, blameless, without spot, when you come for us. We thank you, we love you, that as even as when we are set for our classes, that the Lord will be able to learn and understand them. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Have a blessed day at class. God bless. Thank you. See you again soon. Thank you.